Hi there. Thanks so much for joining me today for the latest episode of Impact Real Estate Investing. My guest today is Heather Hood, VP at Enterprise Community Partners and market leader for Northern California. Heather works to ensure low and moderate income residents have access to affordable quality housing in Northern California. She's written influential pieces on housing issues, helped to create technical assistance programs, and co-chaired Oakland's Housing Cabinet. Heather believes there are a few reasons why we are in the affordable housing pickle we are in. NIMBYism has failed us. Construction costs and the cost of land have soared. We need to permit higher density, and it takes far too long to get permission to build a building. The production line needs to be sped up dramatically. You'll want to hear more. Be sure to go to evepicker.com to find out more about Heather on the show notes page for this episode. And be sure to sign up for my newsletter so you can access information about impact real estate investing and get the latest news about the exciting projects on my crowdfunding platform, Small Change. Hello, Heather. I'm just delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you today. Well, thank you, Eve. It's nice to be here. Good morning. Good morning. Well, midday for me, but good morning to you. Yeah. Good day. (laughs) So you're working on perhaps one of the most difficult challenges of our time, affordable housing in California. And I was hoping we could start talking about how our real estate industry has failed everyday people. And why is there such a huge gap between housing available, and the need? Ah, well, I'm not really sure. Difficult first question. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, a tough, it's a complicated one to unpack. Um, I want to back up there a little bit and question that it's the real estate industry that has failed the population. I think we've all failed. Um, we do not have enough homes for the population, and that's just a simple question of math. Um, there are millions of people who need homes, but we've grown in our state um, with our economy, with jobs, too much and too fast without having the housing production keep up with it. And so that's got our whole system out of whack. We don't have enough housing at any level of affordability, and especially for low and moderate income people. Yeah. The way that that has happened really, I, the reason I was questioning your frame that it's the real estate industry is because there have been many proposals all around the state for housing to be built in the last 30 years. And our population, especially homeowners, have resisted letting it be built. And so that nimbyism, not in my backyard, has um, crimped our production line, construction line, to the point where we're choking now without enough housing. So really, we've failed ourselves, right? We failed ourselves. We failed to see beyond that thing we, some of us may not have wanted on the end of the street. And we thought, oh, it's going to cause traffic or change the character of the neighborhood or invite too many kids into our schools or whatever it was. We, the big we, were nervous about it and wouldn't let it happen. So one of the key things going wrong is is nimbyism. And, um, you know, I thought for a long time developers were really focused on building housing for particular markets. Like you see a lot of these platform projects with small one bedroom studio apartments aimed at millennials. That isn't, you don't think that's part of the problem? Sure. I think that there are multiple problems within the big problem. The big problem is we don't have enough housing. And the construction costs have gotten so darn high with fees and materials and labor and so on, cost of land, because land is such a premium, that um, our private developers feel forced into figuring out how to squeeze the most profit out of each piece of property. And one of the ways to do that is to have the smaller and smaller and smaller units. Yes, and that only meets one segment of the market. And in addition, there's then a push to have lots of amenities 
and those tend to get expensive dog washing stations and roof decks with heat lamps and um, <laughs> jacuzzis and those sorts of things to create an edge to a particular property to entice those segments of the market that are, you know, are targeted. So it's in short called luxury housing. In some parts of the world, it would simply be called regular middle income housing, but because it's in such stark contrast to low income housing that is not subsidized and tends to often be poorly maintained, it appears to be very luxurious. In fact, it is barbell of different types of housing types is, is a big problem. We're not building anything enough in between. The missing middle, right? Well, I'll call it the missing middle, but to be clear, what I mean of the middle is a pretty darn big middle. I mean, most people mean 80% to 150. I mean the middle of between 30% of area median income up to 200% of median income. A big middle is That's a, very a big, big donut middle. hole there. Yeah. 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 Tough to build all of that. What's it going to take to correct course? I was going to say take to correct these things, but I'm just going to say you know, Mm. to correct course? There are a myriad of things. I think the first is to, for the zoning, to allow for higher density and some time limit on how long projects can be held up. And conversely, some better process for stakeholders to be able to influence the outcomes. Um, Right now, there's this kind of, as you know, this rote and very legal CEQA process that um, doesn't invite much conversation or compromise. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, something in the zoning. Um, We need to do something about the construction costs. And maybe the answer there is manufactured housing. I I hope so, because a lot's been invested in that direction. Um, it, it, It also would mean conceiving of projects as being a mix of unit types and income types. Mm-hmm. where we might start to see some cross-subsidy from the pretty big profit that does actually end up being made off of these risky projects and mm-hmm. cross-subsidizing some of the lower income within, either through getting up to a housing trust fund in the city or county or by including affordable units. So that would help. But I'd also emphasize something that our industry probably will start maturing and leaning into, which is the preservation of existing buildings that are affordable. So where there are, especially near transit or other sorts of neighborhood amenities, there are small, medium, and large properties that will likely in the next economic downturn be for sale. And that's a really wonderful opportunity for publicly motivated entities, whether they're cities or nonprofit developers, to purchase them and renovate them, make them much healthier and permanently affordable for the folks who live there now. That would help a great deal with the displacement challenges. And that sort of technique is cheaper than building new construction. And then we can leave the new expensive construction to the um, some affordable housing developers and the uh, so-called luxury housing developers. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Do you know of people or organizations that are taking these course corrections? I mean, we've all heard about ADUs, which is one way of mixing Mm -hmm. market, right? But that's only one Mm -hmm. little way. Yeah, uh, I'll mention a couple that I've worked with. One is East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation. It's a community development nonprofit developer in Oakland, California, who has been purchasing properties where people live now, these are once dilapidated apartment buildings with 30 or 60 units, or sometimes in the case of one portfolio scattered around the city a very different small and medium properties that they bought from existing owners. Maybe they were kids who wanted to get out of the inheritance of owning these or mm-hmm. different stories. And they've been renovating them, bringing them up to code and working carefully with the residents to help them figure out where to live for a little bit of time while the renovations are getting done. Um, And then they end up being much more handsome properties, less blight in the neighborhood and appreciated much better by the tenants who know that they can stay. I'm sure, yeah. That's one organization. There's another one called the Oakland Community Land Trust. And land trusts actually are doing this more and more. Um, These tend to be smaller organizations, like one to five staff who 
tend to be buying just one little building that's maybe got a cafe on the ground floor and two units above or a few single family houses in the neighborhood as they come available. This is something where the land um, remains in the holding of the nonprofit organization and the building itself gets owned by residents or commercial owners. And they've been looking for those kind of opportunities for a good while. Yeah, okay. This is so it's a, it's an organic process that looks like it's gonna take a while to correct course. I mean, that's in California. I don't know if it's happening anywhere else. Of course it, it New York is much more mature as an industry in, in what we would call preservation. Mm-hmm. You know, in the three Ps producing housing, preserving affordability or protecting tenants. Mm-hmm. The second P of, of preservation is a more mature technique in other parts of the country. But I think we have the potential in California to shift our industry to add this technique at a much bigger scale to our mm-hmm. And now is the time to do that. Interesting. Yeah. So what about financial institutions? You know, what sort of role are they taking? I mean, this is an especially difficult time to find financing of any kind. What are you seeing in that, aside from your own organization? Mm-hmm. So this is along the lines of things that could shift to, to change the outcome? Yeah. I mean, along the lines of, you know, are there financial institutions that are taking a stake in this affordable housing problem and shifting more funds towards it, making it easier to borrow money for that type of project, any of the above? Yeah. So many of us are. I work at Enterprise Community Partners, and that's what we wake up and do every day is um, finance policy and technical assistance. On the financial team, whether it's a nonprofit community development financial institution like ours or others um, or a bank, I think what this moment in our history has done is sort of rattled us and said, you know what, what we've got to do is take more quote-unquote risk in projects. So there's an something called underwriting, which is to figure out if the proposal of a project makes financial sense, if the borrower has the chop to carry it out. There's a safety net that's been built in so that if things start to go awry, there's a cushion. And all that is in the interest of making sure any the various investors will eventually get their money back and the project gets done and people get to live there. There, In the underwriting process, there are scores for risk. And in order to get a development done in, a, in certain geographies that would be, be quote-unquote risky or cities that are quote-unquote risky or some developers who are newer to the stage, especially new affordable housing developers, there's a, naturally some scrutiny. But we could probably all relax just a bit to make sure that more projects can flow mm-hmm. and the dollars flow. And I'll have to say that this moment is forcing the financial industry to really look at itself and see that back to the 60s and 70s, the financial institution through redlining and blockbusting really made it, their version of risky is what was quite racist and is what led to creating some of the marginalization that we see in neighborhoods today that are hot neighborhoods. And so it takes some responsibility, sort of an interesting form of reparation to Mm -hmm. see to it that the neighborhoods get a much better chance and the people in them get a much better chance to determine their fate and develop things as they would like. So it's going to take some fairly major shifts in a variety of industries to really solve this problem. And then, you know, I wonder what the role of government is in all of this. I mean, zoning definitely has cramped everyone's style, but. Yeah. Government can do a lot. My perspective on government, and it's not all government, so I'm going to make it, but I'll I'll just make a generalization that through various tax codes, especially in California, Prop 13, we've, through those sort of larger policies, we've forced governments, local governments, to be looking for those things that would create tax bases. 
Mm -hmm. So invite one in commercial private development, because that's where you get taxes in order to do the things the cities want to do, take care of parks, take care of public work, Mm -hmm. ensure safety and services and summer camps and all that kind of good stuff. So the cities are forced to have to find that through commercial development and to dissuade residential development to some degree. So different cities have responded in their own ways to that reality. But if we had a different tax code and cities were not forced into that kind of cattywampus position, they could get back to balancing the various interests, whether they be mission oriented or private interests. Interesting. Yeah. So, so they wouldn't have to be sort of pretending to have a putting lip service to the public good, but having in order to execute on that, to do a lot of gymnastics with um, capitalism. So this problem really runs really deep, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. We can talk at the surface level, but, but that's what, what really, let government be government for the people and all the people of all the, in, with all the interests. Right. I want to shift gears a little bit and just ask you about yourself because I noticed that you trained as an architect like I did and then as an urban planner and I'm just wondering what prompted that shift. Oh, well, I'd love to know your story too. Um, But I'll I'll tell you mine. It's a little bit of a long story. I'll try to make it short. I wanted to be an architect since I was a little girl. I love designing and spatial relations and 3D things. And so we would do it little floor plans for fun starting on summer vacation because my parents would let us watch TV and then it just kind of grew into admiring buildings where I grew up in Philadelphia or on trips that we were lucky enough to take I got to go to architecture school twice because I was sure that's what I wanted to do except that when I practiced it interning or working in, in junior positions at architecture firms it really seemed as if the architects were the last ones called during oh, yeah, absolutely. the, the <laughs> early 90s and <laughs> mid-90s. And I just thought, now, wait a minute. I don't want to be the last one called. And, you know, when you're under 30 as an architect, you tend to just be sitting at a CAD machine. So I thought, well, this isn't the life I want. Um, as much as I love my colleagues and the buildings and the construction process and all that good stuff. I just love it. I mean, I'm looking from my window right now and I see five cranes in the air and I just uh-huh. love watching buildings get built. Yeah. I just love yeah. it. Um, endlessly entertaining. Um, so I happened to be at UC Berkeley and I walked down the hall of the College of Environmental Design from the architecture to the city planning department to sign up for our course. And it was, I think it was women in planning. And Betty, Professor Betty Deacon was teaching it and she just had other women from the field, landscape architecture, architecture, industrial design, city planning come in. And I got really jazzed about city planning. I thought, oh, this is what I want to do. I just didn't know what to call it. Yeah. I wanted to make neighborhoods and cities yeah. with wonderful mm-hmm. buildings for people in them. Okay, that's called city planning. <laughs> so it was as simple as that. Yes. Got to go to Berkeley for a couple more years and chase that dream. And then you shifted into finance, sort of. Sort of, yes. I was lucky enough to work for UC Berkeley doing campus planning, mostly on the urban, off-campus, urban side. And then to be on some boards that were involved in things that affected social justice in cities. And I was lucky enough to get to work on an initiative called the Great Communities Collaborative at, based at the San Francisco Foundation, which was a really wonderful way to work with 25 organizations and 14 funders to figure out how can we in the Bay Area make sure that there's higher density and more community benefits surrounding our transit nodes in the region. And that takes a lot of organizing and envisioning and technical stuff. And so we banded together to make that happen. And I got so excited about that. It was hard, but wonderful group of people and important wins along the way, except I got into it long enough to know that if there wasn't money for what was being planned, (laughs) that things were not going to happen. Yes. It was great to make sure that the density was approved by city council or that more affordable housing would be built in a place 
or that in the building there would be a minimum number of jobs. And that's all great, except if there wasn't the financing in place to underpinning that, um, there, things would be stuck. And so I just thought I've got to learn how this works and pursued a job at Enterprise, which was the only organization that was a financial institution that I wanted to work for because it, I shared the values and I, I loved all the things they did around the country. And I was incredibly fortunate to have been hired to take that job. Yeah. That was the moment. And I'm still learning a lot about financing. There's endless to, amounts to learn. Not, I'm not all the way there. Yes. Yeah. It's going to take the rest of my life to really get it. Well, I always think that architects are uniquely trained to think through challenges. Architecture school, we're trained to take an idea and to turn it into something and I, in a very creative way. And I can't think of another profession where you can really quite do that. So mm-hmm. I love to see architects kind of littered across the landscape in different roles because I, I also think architecture schools fail our students, the students who need to understand that they have so many more options because they have such, I think, special training. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I actually started as an architect and then went and did a master's in urban design at Columbia for similar reasons. I was really fascinated by cities more than mm-hmm. iconic buildings. And I wanted to know how cities sort of work together. And when I moved to Pittsburgh, I worked for a planning department as an urban designer and, and loved that job. But I worked for an architect for a while and always felt like, you know, we were at the end of everything. There I was sitting doing stair details whereas Mm -hmm. you know I really wanted to understand how you did development projects and put it together so I went a slightly different route and started doing my own projects and figuring out financing and and yeah it is all about money (laughs) unfortunately so you became a developer yeah I I I became a developer and then when uh, and then when the funds dried up they sort of shifted after the Bush administration and the bank meltdown I sat back and sort of tried to figure out what to do next and then launched small change really on this uh, real estate crowdfunding platform to fill in those pieces of financing that I think are so important to creating new ideas in the in the physical landscape Mm -hmm. they're the ideas that generally are not financed so anyway this is way too much about me (laughs) oh no it's fascinating i i love hearing how people make decisions to curl into the next thing and especially when i think of younger generations as i mentor people and people call and ask what should i do next which i'm not sure how to think about this and there's a great deal of worry people have about there's so many things yeah, that or, or they start off their career and how do I get from here to there? And the truth is everybody's career is fairly curly. It is curly, yeah. And you don't really know the best path from here to there and you might change your mind. Yeah, and you should enjoy the journey. Yeah. <laughs> right, us planners have to be more relaxed with improvising. I certainly am learning that. Yeah, certainly there was a period when I really worried about people looking at my resume and thinking, she can't stick to anything, you know. Uh-huh. But I think that time has passed, and I think now, you know, people are in jobs for much shorter times because there's really a much wider array array of opportunities, which I think is really fascinating. Yep. Well, thanks for sharing that. I wanted to ask you, what do we need to think about to make our cities and neighborhoods better places for everyone? Oh goodness, that's a <laughs> really big question. Um, Well, in terms of even financing, you know, how can we make places more equitable and better places for everyone? Because we know that we're far, far from that, right? Yeah, well, I had the good fortune of studying in Denmark and living in Copenhagen for only six months in 1988, but I have never forgotten it. Oh, lucky you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I was supposed to go back this May just for a stint with an organization here in it can't because of COVID, but absolutely in love with the Scandinavian way of thinking about this, where they've got big taxes and they carefully pour them back into the public realm in both services and in the physical landscape. And so what we have here is it seems like we just think in terms of me, 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 we think of all the properties as being separate and maybe there's some design codes and 
zoning code to keep things what we think is harmonious, but we still think of them as separate. And the only thing that ties things together are the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, and did you know mm-hmm. that about 25% of most urban suburban landscapes is streets? And in suburbs, it's even more. Oh, yeah. And they're very highly occupied by cars instead of pedestrians. Yeah. So those are the things that hold us symbolically, if you think about that, that cars and concrete and, or not concrete, asphalt is what ties us all these things together. And that doesn't set the mood the right way. So if we thought of these places as for everyone and we put much more emphasis in the public realm, I think that would be a really good start. But what do we want to put there? Asking the people who are there and really listening to them um, and learning from other places and getting ideas and making trade-offs so people don't think that they're going to get everything, but make conscious decisions about what they prefer. I think that would be a great way to start. But in order to execute, we need those public dollars at, goodness gracious, I don't even know, 10 times the scale that we have now to, yeah. to have that. Yeah. People have spoken about that. If you think about the Open Streets program, I launched an Open Streets in Pittsburgh, and it's been wildly (laughs) successful. People just love it. That is a lineal park for one day a month. It really should be a lineal park the whole time. (laughs) Um, But they flock to events like that all over the country, all over the world, and that's kind of speaking to what people want, right? Yeah. Well, when I took my son's, to Disneyland, I was fascinated at how much Disneyland had so much public space and walkability and water features and cafe-like settings. And I find it fascinating that we are, as a culture, willing to pay enormous amounts of money to have that experience as if it's an entertainment rather than to pay enormous amounts of money into our own environment to have that same sort of actual feeling on yeah. a daily basis. So I feel like we have these clues with the open streets and the way that cafe culture has come back and outdoor beer gardens have come back where you can see that there's a hunger there. I think we just haven't quite figured out how to go beyond the property line. Yeah, but Copenhagen sure oh, has. Yeah. You can get easily run over by a bike there. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful city. I love it. One other question. What community engagement tools have you seen that have really worked? Oh. You talk about really listening. Yeah. So I'm calling that into question myself. And I have seen people demonstrate what's possible using apps for stakeholders to put in their preferences or to note where there's a click it, fix it kind of. I see a pothole or a speed bump problem or whatever, and or a tree that's dying. And yes. So yep. seems, seems pretty good. Admittedly, my planning thesis in grad school, 1997, was about how planners could engender democracy through better participation. And I had a particular mm-hmm. angle on how that could happen, which was making sure people had the information that they need and a forum for conversation and decision making. But I stand by that. Except that I don't know what the best technique is. I've been searching for that for over two decades. It is not evening meeting. No, for sure. In a dank community room with somebody with a mic and people sitting in cold chairs with cold food um, and no child care and no <laughs> language translation, listening to somebody say, here's responding to a plan that's already been pretty well baked. It's not that. It's not endless council meetings that go until one in the morning. You know, there's a private organization that I've been inspired by called Suda. Man, it's a developer, Alan Dones and Regina Davis, who are doing a really interesting project in West Oakland. And to hear how they got community feedback was really interesting because it wasn't necessarily these meetings. It was spending a good deal of time and I mean years, in a community like West Oakland and listening to what people were saying on the streets and going to barbecues and churches and hearing what it was that was on people's minds and forming relationships with people more in the immediate surrounds of the West Oakland BART where they're going to be doing some four blocks of development. Um, so that they were building up a sensibility for what the community said it wants to 
and building the mm-hmm. trustful relationship to then eventually present an idea and respond to that on an iterative basis. So something along the lines of actually really listening and taking your time with it um, and not just doing it in apps, mm-hmm. but in some face-to-face activities seem to be on to something. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of work for tiny developers. I think, you know, we got to figure out something better. Well, the city planners who are doing the neighborhood planning or the district planning could be doing a lot of that over time and then yeah. let the smaller developers who are filling in hear all about it, take the time to do that. Yeah. I'm hoping that equity crowdfunding can play a little role uh-huh. too because, you know, my platform anyone over the age of 18 can invest. And I think if people can have a stake in development in their own neighborhoods, that's certainly what I learned in Pittsburgh, that people wanted to have a stake. So it doesn't have to be very big. It's just meaningful. Yeah. Um, And then someone else talked to me about power mapping, which I thought was really interesting as well. An interesting idea to kind of understand where the power in a neighborhood lies and talking to those people and getting really... Uh, I suppose I don't want to say enlisting the help, but but that's it's like almost like a pyramid reaching everyone in the neighborhood. I I thought it was really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Well, there's power mapping and there's there's empower mapping because in the power mapping we tend to want to go to the people who hold the power to make the shifts and create the influence we need, but we also have the opportunity to figure out well, who doesn't have power, who should. Oh, I think all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to do. All of this takes a great deal of time and in our lives when everybody's rushing to get things done like we all do. Yes. Or rushing to sort of make sure that things are going to pencil out. It's very hard to slow down a little bit and do that. Although it can really go a long way. I'm excited about the crowdfunding you're talking about. I mean, at one level, real estate's always been crowdfunded. It's just at bigger chunks and formal uh, legal entities. And to have it available to the individual. It sounds so neat and interesting. I can't wait to see where it goes. But it also seems like we don't learn about design often or construction or how cities are made or all the systems that go into that in our American school system. And so it's kind of no wonder if we haven't yes. really built up a sensibility for it. And I'm thinking that maybe through crowdfunding, people will feel more connected to whatever it is that they've invested in. Perhaps. It requires a lot of education, but I suppose everything does. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you? I mean, the big project that you can talk about or anything that's got your interest at the moment? Well, um, I have a team of about 15 people in the Northern California office at Enterprise. We have a, typically have a San Francisco office and a Stockton office, but right now everybody's at home. Um, I'm excited to have to work with such a great team. And we've organized ourselves around a couple different big principles. And so just getting to organize ourselves and be clear about that is important to me. Um, We have two things. One is strengthening community resilience and the other is building sustainable neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So one is about making sure that we're sort of holding ground in neighborhoods and help people figure out how to stay where they are if they want to stay. That's through renter protection work or preservation work like we talked about earlier, some work in public housing and then also in resilience. And by that, I mean both community resilience in a cultural way, but responding to all these disasters, the fires and the earthquakes Mm -hmm, and all mm -hmm. this stuff that keeps happening in California. So it's sort of having gotten clear with the team about that's what we're about. And that body of work, it's about strengthening community resilience in a myriad of different ways. And then the other part is creating these big new systems. Like, I'm really excited that my team and I had this idea that there really ought to be a regional housing entity, that the little cities, the many cities just don't have the bandwidth or chops and finances to execute on what -hmm. what they mean well to do for affordable and market rate housing. But at the regional scale, which makes more sense. And so feeling very, very happy that this has been accepted by the state legislature and the governor and we're actually doing it here in this region with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and ABAG. That's fabulous. Yeah, it is. And it's just a fantastic group of people who really want to see it happen. So those things are exciting for me. I also think that there's something exciting happening in general 
which is that maybe one of the silver linings of this awful pandemic that is so awful for so many people. Um, and, and it's, it's going to bring down potentially our whole economy <laughs> But in all of that awful. Yes. Um, we might get a chance to rethink zoning and think about how, you know, you can't shelter in place if you don't have shelter. Therefore, it's in all of our self-interest to really make sure that everybody has a home. So I'm excited that maybe this has been a real wake-up call that will help my industry hurry up and figure out how to get out of our own way and make sure that people are not homeless and people have safe places for their souls to rest that they can call home. Yes. Well, I think that's a really exciting end and I really enjoyed our conversation and hope your work meets great success and I'll, I'll be following it. Uh, thank you, Eve. It's really nice to hear your story too. That was Heather Hood. She's fully immersed in the affordable housing crisis, working to help solve it in Northern California. Heather believes that NIMBYism has failed us, along with zoning too. We need to permit higher density to fill the need, and it takes far too long to get permission to build a building. The production line needs to be sped up dramatically. Heather's also astonished that we'll spend a fortune visiting places like Disneyland where we can enjoy walkability, but we won't spend that on the places we live in. I'm right there with her. You can find out more about Impact Real Estate Investing and access the show notes for today's episode at my website, evepicker.com. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to find out more about how to make money in real estate while building better cities. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. And thank you, Heather, for sharing your thoughts. We'll talk again soon. But for now, this is Eve Picker signing off to go make some change.